Just imagine a single underground pipe stretching 1150 kilometers across an entire country, now almost tripling its capacity to carry liquid gold. This isn't just any pipe, it's a massive steel artery up to 106.7 centimeters wide, pushing 141,500 cubic meters of crude oil every single day, enough to fill over 56 Olympic-sized swimming pools daily. This engineering marvel, the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, has burst past its initial cost of 5 billion Canadian dollars, ballooning to an astonishing 34 billion dollars. It's a project that demanded tunneling under mountains, drilling beneath mighty rivers, and navigating some of the toughest terrain on Earth, all while facing a storm of opposition. How did engineers pull off such a feat? And was the monumental price tag truly worth it? The story of the Trans Mountain Pipeline isn't new. It actually began way back in 1953. Back then, it was a much simpler, smaller pipeline built to carry oil from Edmonton, Alberta, all the way to Burnaby, British Columbia, on Canada's Pacific Coast. For decades, it quietly did its job, moving crude oil to refineries and terminals, becoming a vital, though often unseen, part of Canada's energy system. But as Canada's oil production grew, especially from the oil sands, the old pipeline just wasn't big enough anymore. It was like trying to pour a waterfall through a garden hose. So the idea came about, build a second, much bigger pipeline right next to the first one, essentially twinning it. This wasn't just about moving more oil, it was about connecting Canada's landlocked energy reserves to global markets, especially in Asia, providing a direct route for Canadian oil to reach buyers beyond North America. This vision, however, would soon run into incredible challenges, turning a simple expansion into a decades-long saga. So, how do you even begin to build nearly 1,000 kilometers of new, giant pipeline through some of the most rugged landscapes imaginable? The Trans Mountain Expansion, or TMX as it's known, wasn't just laying pipe in flat fields. It was an epic battle against nature and engineering limits. One of the most mind-boggling parts of the project was boring the Burnaby Mountain Tunnel in an urban area. Imagine trying to thread a giant needle under a bustling city through solid rock. That's what they did. This tunnel is 2.6 kilometers long, which is like walking across 26 football fields laid end to end. It's almost more than 4 meters wide, taller than a standard basketball hoop. Inside this massive underground pathway, three 76.2 centimeter pipelines, about the size of large car tires, now carry oil. To dig this tunnel, engineers used a specialized machine called a tunnel boring machine, or TBM, nicknamed Burnaby Nelly. Think of it as a massive, super strong metal worm. At its front, a huge rotating cutting head, covered in sharp disks, grinds away at the rock and soil. As it chews through the ground, conveyor belts behind the cutter head carry away the crushed rock, called muck, out of the tunnel. At the same time, the TBM lays down concrete segments, like giant building blocks, to create the strong, circular walls of the tunnel right behind it. This process allowed them to dig under the mountain without disturbing the homes and university campus directly above, keeping the city safe and sound. Then there were the incredibly tricky river crossings. Rivers are vital ecosystems, and you can't just dig them up. The solution for many of the 75 major crossings, including the mighty Fraser River, was horizontal directional drilling, or HDD. Picture this, instead of digging an open trench through the riverbed, HDD is like performing underground surgery. First, a small pilot hole is drilled from one side of the river, going deep under the riverbed and emerging on the other side. This pilot hole is only about 30 centimeters wide, like a dinner plate. Once the pilot hole is complete, a much larger cutting tool, called a reamer, is pulled back through the pilot hole, making it wider and wider in stages, until it's big enough for the pipeline. 
For the Fraser River crossing, which stretched 1.4 kilometers, it was like threading a giant, flexible hose underground for nearly a mile. The conditions under the Fraser River were incredibly challenging, with unpredictable soil and rock. Once the hole was big enough, the pre-assembled steel pipeline, coated with special abrasion-resistant material to protect it, was pulled through the enlarged tunnel. This technique is expensive and time-consuming, but it protects the river's sensitive environment and avoids stopping ship traffic. But the biggest natural challenge was the Rocky Mountains. The pipeline slices through steep, jagged terrain, often facing slopes so steep you could barely walk up them. Here, traditional digging methods were impossible or too risky. Engineers had to use incredibly precise techniques. For clearing paths through solid rock, they used controlled blasting. Experts carefully measure the exact amount of explosives needed, place them in specific patterns in drilled holes, and then set them off in tiny, millisecond-long delays. This controlled explosion breaks the rock into manageable pieces without sending debris flying everywhere or causing massive landslides. It's like breaking a giant cookie into small, neat pieces. Once the rock was cleared, moving the heavy steel pipe sections, each weighing tons and measuring up to 106.7 centimeters wide, up and down these perilous slopes was another feat. They used specialized cable crane systems, like massive zip lines, to carefully lower pipe sections down steep ravines or pull them up sheer cliffs. These systems ensured that both workers and equipment stayed safe while handling materials in extremely dangerous, avalanche-prone areas. Beyond these major hurdles, the pipeline itself is a marvel of material science and safety. The new pipe is made of high-strength steel, thicker and stronger than what's usually found in pipelines. Each section is factory coated with a tough, fusion-bonded epoxy powder to prevent rust and corrosion, even after decades underground. For sections drilled under the rivers or roads, an extra layer of abrasion-resistant overlay is added, like a super-durable suit of armor to protect the pipe as it's pulled through rock and soil. Safety isn't just about tough pipes. The TMX system uses incredibly advanced technology to prevent spills. A nerve center called a centralized control center monitors the entire 1150 kilometer pipeline 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It uses a high-tech system called SCADA, which is like a giant digital brain, constantly checking flow rates, pressure, and the oil's characteristics. If anything seems off, like a sudden drop in pressure or a change in flow, an alarm goes off. The system also has automatic leak detection and emergency shutdown features, which can close special valves along the pipeline to stop oil flow almost instantly if a problem is found. They even laid a fiber optic cable right alongside the new pipeline. This cable acts like a super sensitive ear, listening for tiny vibrations, temperature changes, or ground movement that could signal a problem, giving engineers an early warning system. Every one of the 12 new powerful pump stations along the route, which act like the pipeline's heart, is also equipped with ultrasonic flow meters, giving super accurate readings of how much oil is moving, adding another layer of security. Once the oil reaches the coast, it arrives at the West Ridge Marine Terminal near Vancouver. This terminal had to be massively upgraded to handle the huge increase in oil flow. The old facilities were replaced with three new berths, which are like parking spots for giant oil tankers. These berths are specifically designed to safely load Aframax tankers, which are mid-sized oil ships, onto their journey across the Pacific. To feed these tankers, the project also greatly expanded the amount of oil storage. At the Burnaby Terminal alone, 14 new storage tanks were built, massively increasing the storage capacity there from 1.685 million barrels to 5.555 million barrels. This expanded capacity is crucial for handling the massive flow of oil and ensuring smooth loading onto ships. This entire project, while a staggering engineering accomplishment, has come with a price tag that has shocked many. 
It swelled from an initial estimate of around 5 to 7 billion Canadian dollars to a colossal 34 billion dollars by 2024. The Canadian government, which bought the pipeline in 2018 when its original owner, Kinder Morgan, faced too much opposition, now plans to sell it off, hoping to recover some of the public money invested. This massive cost overrun has fueled intense public debate, with critics calling it a boondoggle. Beyond the finances, the project has faced fierce opposition from environmental groups and many indigenous communities. Concerns range from the increased risk of a major oil spill in the sensitive Salish Sea, home to endangered killer whales and vital salmon runs, to the impact of increased tanker traffic, which creates underwater noise that can harm marine life. There are worries about diluted bitumen, the type of oil carried, sinking in water if spilled, making cleanup incredibly difficult. Many First Nations communities also spoke out against the project, arguing that their consent was not properly obtained, and they raised serious concerns about the impact on their lands, waters, and cultural heritage, as well as the social issues arising from temporary work camps, often called man camps, near their communities. Despite these deep-seated concerns and legal battles that went all the way to Canada's highest courts, the project pushed forward and began commercial operations on May 1, 2024, though it's still in its final testing phase before reaching full capacity later this year. What do you think about the Trans Mountain Pipeline? A necessary lifeline or a costly gamble? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe for more amazing engineering stories and hit that notification bell so you don't miss our next adventure.